Hello there, Wes Terasaki here. Our study for today is Matthew chapter 25, plus the last 16 verses of chapter 24 that we did not cover last time. This is the last half of the Olivet Discourse, the last major sermon by Christ before his arrest and crucifixion. The first verse forms the thesis for the entire section, but about that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. The rest of the Olivet Discourse is all about the consequences of this central truth. Today we will look at some parables or parable-like teachings, sometimes called the parables of the parousia. There are five. The final section of chapter 24 is The Day and Hour Unknown. It includes two parables, the homeowner and the thief in the night, and the good and the wicked servant. Then chapter 25 has three sections, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the bags of gold, and the sheep and the goats. In the day and hour unknown, the day is the parousia, or the second coming of Christ. It will come unexpectedly and unpredictably, like a thief in the night. The apostles Paul, Peter, and John all confirm this using the same simile. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying, Peace and safety. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. This is not to say his coming will be secretive or unnoticed like a thief. Rather, it will be surprising and unanticipated like a thief. Let's look at the thesis statement again. No one but the Father knows when the parousia will occur, not even angels, not even Christ himself. How is it that even Jesus does not know the day and the hour? Is he not God, and isn't God all-knowing? This is a clear demonstration of how Jesus voluntarily limited the use of his divine attributes so that he could be truly human. The Apostle Paul understood the necessity for Christ to be fully God, yet fully human. He said, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus will return and his coming will be sudden. The timing is unknown, and many will not expect it just like the people of Noah's time who were engaged in usual everyday activities when the flood came, or just like the two men in the field, or the two women grinding grain. We should say a word about verses 40 and 41. Some Christians believe these are describing a sudden mysterious disappearance of Christians all around the world. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Some people call this the rapture. If you've read the book series Left Behind by Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins, then you know this would result in all sorts of bizarre, tragic situations, like cars on the freeway suddenly missing their drivers and planes flying without pilots. And those left behind will wonder where everyone went. But according to Matthew, this is not how it goes down. What he describes is not a separate event that is primarily a disappearing act by lots of people. Here the taking and leaving of men and women are related to Christ's coming. And as we saw earlier in this same chapter, his coming will be visible and obvious worldwide. There will be a loud trumpet call and lightning from east to west. All people will see this and mourn. There will be no mystery. We come now to the parables of the parousia. We could even call these the expectations of the parousia. In the first, which is about a thief and a homeowner, Christ's return is completely unexpected. In the second parable, 
about two servants, the return happens sooner than expected, much to the shock of the one irresponsible servant. In the third, the virgins find out about the consequences of being unprepared when the return occurs later than they expected. And in the story of the gold or talents, two people are expecting the return and one is not. Expectation motivates preparation. The first two parables are relatively brief and self-explanatory. In fact, many Bible translations like the NIV do not give them their own individual subheadings. In the homeowner and the thief in the night, the word for thief is kleptes, from which we derive the word kleptomaniac. It means the common thief or robber who steals for his own benefit. We should note that the modern conception of a police force was non-existent in first century Jewish society, and owners had individual responsibility for protecting their homes. The only way to prevent a break-in was to be alert and watchful. In The Good and the Wicked Servant, there are two servants, both given charge of a household in the master's absence. One is wise and responsible, and in the end he is rewarded with greater responsibility, authority, and privilege. The other is irresponsible, cruel, and indulgent. When the master returns unexpectedly, he is severely punished. The parable reminds us to live in such a manner that we would have no cause for shame if he did come at any time, since he may, in fact, do so. The third parable is the parable of the ten virgins. Virgins generally means young unmarried women, but in this story it might be best interpreted as bridesmaids. The setting is a wedding. Although we don't know exactly how weddings were celebrated in first century Jewish culture, they were probably something like this. On the day of the wedding, the bridegroom would leave his house and go to the bride's house. The bride and her bridesmaids would be there waiting for him. Once he arrives, the wedding party would parade in a nighttime processional to the groom's house, where there would be a prolonged party and banquet. The bridesmaids would be responsible for lighting the way with lamps or torches. In this parable, there are ten girls who bring lamps, but only five of them bring enough oil to last the evening. The bridegroom is delayed and arrives very late. When he does, the five girls who are adequately prepared are able to participate in the torchlight processional and go into the party at the groom's house. The other five are left out. This parable is a limited allegory with three main characters. The groom represents Christ, his arrival the parousia, and the party the messianic banquet. In multiple places in the Old Testament, God is portrayed as the husband of his people, and twice in Matthew, Jesus has already implied that he is the bridegroom. The wise and foolish virgins are those who, spiritually, are either prepared or unprepared for judgment. Thus the exhortation is, be prepared. We should probably not make too big of a thing over the meaning of the oil, or the number ten, or the number five or that the girls fell asleep while waiting for the groom. But there are other things we should note. Christ's coming may take longer than we think. Preparing for his coming may take more prep work than we think. There may be a point of no return where getting ready is no longer possible. It may be later than we think. The foolish, simply by association with the wise, are not included. Entrance to the banquet may not be as automatic as we think. We don't prepare for Christ's coming by calculating the date, as some Christians try to do, but by living a life of readiness and responsiveness to God. What this looks like, we see in the next two parables. The Parable of the Bags of Gold This has been called the Parable of the Talents. The story is about three servants entrusted with money by their master. This money varies in type and amount depending on which Bible translation you read. It can be bags of gold, talents, bags of silver, gold coins, or dollars. It doesn't matter. What matters is that the master expects the servants to be good stewards of his money in his absence. 
The first two servants put the money to use in some way and end up doubling the value. The third guy is afraid of losing it, so he buries the money. When the master returns, the first two are praised and rewarded for their diligence and resourcefulness, but the third is punished for his fear and laziness. If we look at God as being like the master and us as the servants, we understand at least these things. God entrusts us with resources and expects us to make profitable use of them. Faithful, prudent stewardship is rewarded. Failure to use God's resources for His service is punished. Waiting on God is not a passive affair, but a time to be wise and productive. Note that the third servant chooses to play it safe, risk nothing, achieve nothing, and he even blames his master for his choices. That God is both a generous rewarder and a stern judge is a biblically consistent portrait of who he is. Note that talent does not mean our abilities or giftedness as it does in English. It is a quantity of money, but it represents all that we would invest for God, our time, our energies, our material resources, and as we will see in the last story, our compassion. The sheep and the goats. This is not strictly a parable. It is a scene that takes place at the end of the age. A time will come when Jesus returns in glory. He will separate all people into two groups, much like a shepherd might separate sheep and goats. One group will be rewarded and given eternal life, while the other will be sent into eternal punishment. What is the criterion used for making the separation? It is how each group treated the least of Christ's brothers and sisters, because how one treats these little ones is tantamount to how one treats Jesus himself. That's it. Let's make a few observations that may not be immediately obvious. First off, let's be clear, there's nothing wrong with goats. Jesus just uses them to make a point in this parable-like illustration. This passage deals only with works. Nothing is said about grace or faith, but grace is assumed. Recall in Matthew 16, Jesus said, The Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. So also the Apostle Paul. Before the judgment seat of Christ, each of us will receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. In other words, we are saved by grace and judged by works. Well, what works are these? Is Jesus saying that all men have a social responsibility to care for the poor in this world? Well, certainly this is true if we look elsewhere in the Bible. But in this particular context, he is talking specifically about how one treats believers. Those who have not followed Jesus will be judged by how they treat those who have. As we see, the sheep and goats represent believers and unbelievers. Unbelievers show by their disregard for believers that they are opposed to Christ and thereby unsaved. And believers have a special responsibility to care for poor and underprivileged Christians. As the Apostle Paul said, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So our passage then is not about humanitarianism in general. It is about responding to Jesus and his people. As we close, let's summarize the five parables of the parousia. This is a slide we saw earlier. What can we take home from these parables? Be watchful. Be responsible. Be prepared. Be productive. And be compassionate. You see, the Olivet Discourse shows us how to look to the future, but live in the present. More than anything, the parables of the future are not about the future. They are about life in the present. The parables summon people to wise and faithful living. 
Their purpose is to persuade people in view of God's future, to do the will of the Father, and to show His compassion. All else is ancillary. So look to the future, but live in the present. Live as though Jesus is coming back today, but plan as though He is not coming back for a hundred years.